Good morning. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church on this sunny morning. Cool but sunny. It's nice that, uh, that we get to see the sun. Several announcements for this morning. The spring seed giveaway is still going on in the library. So if you want some seeds for your garden this year, go on and take a look and see what's left out there. Um, we had the thank you reception for Lindsay, and you see all those cupcakes out there. So there's a lot of cupcakes. You all need to take some cupcakes home with you because there's still a whole other tray of cupcakes in the refrigerator. So. <laughs> And whatever's left will come upstairs tonight at 6 o'clock for the um, Just Flix film, Philomena. Uh, you can read about what it's about in your bulletin insert, but that's 6 o'clock upstairs in the dining room, and then there'll be a conversation after that led by Clooney John. So um, it's going to be a good night up there, and they're going to have cupcakes, so it doesn't get any better. Um, other things to pay attention to... Um, the Lenten soup suppers are still going on, and um, we will be meeting again Wednesday night, so sign on up and get some good soups. We've had fabulous soups this last week, and good conversations on prayer and um, putting that into practice in our lives. Um, some of you might know, but um, Jane Spires passed away this week on Thursday night, and uh, Jane has been a faithful member of this congregation for many, many years, I think since coming to Milliken. Uh, she got here and she never left from that. Uh, we can't say how many lives Jane, Jane changed with all the work that she did with her school in the school system and leading. Um, she was involved in many community projects, the NAACP. I know she worked a lot with them. Um, so let, let's say a prayer right now. Dear Lord, indeed, we thank you for Jane for her beautiful smile, for her welcoming personality, for her love of all of your children, God. Jane never saw a stranger, and she would go out and greet and meet and welcome. Lord, be with Becky and her family and with Wally as they um, go through this week. Um, give good strength and courage, and let us give thanks for a life so well lived and the blessings that we all have received from knowing Jane and being with her over these past few years. Uh, bless this congregation um, as we remember Jane in our conversations and um, the way that we will support Becky and Wally in this week. We pray this together in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, the service is going to be on Thursday and we're hoping for Thursday afternoon. So just so you all know that, it'll be here Thursday in the afternoon. And um, we hope you all come. So with that, let us stand and turn and greet each other with the peace of Christ. Peace be with you, dear. Oh. <laughs> Please join me in the call to worship. 
Holy God, as we gather in worship, fill us with your compassion so that we may love others as you love us. As we offer our prayers, heal our wounds and redeem your creation. As we listen to your word, bring us hope and courage to live a life of service. As we sing our praises to you, the vision of peace and justice among all people. Please join me in the prayer of confession. When we abandon you, Lord, pull us back into your heart. When we do not rely on you, help us to trust. When we do not seek you, record our priorities. When we are prideful, When we get off the path, turn to us. Do not be conformed to this world, 
but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. We have become in your moment. Believe the good news that in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Amen. be seated. Can I have all the children come down? Put this way, Maya. Can you afford it? All right. Perfect. Let's knock on the tree and see if Victor's in there. Hey, Victor, are you in there? Oh, oh hey. hi there. Hey, it's good to see you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, hey, I got a question for you. Okay, what's your question? So uh, uh, you always say a prayer, right? Well, yes, we usually say a prayer when we get together here. Oh, so, so prayer is when you talk to God, right? Yes, that's one way to think about prayer. It's talking to God. Oh, good, good. Then I got some things I want you to tell God next time you pray. Hmm, all right, what do you have in mind? Yeah, yeah, so could you ask God to put some pepperoni on my pizza? Uh, why can't you put pepperonis on your pizza by yourself? Oh, because I ran out, and I don't want to go all the way to the store, <laughs> so I thought you could just get God to do it. You know, Victor, that's not really what prayer is about. Doesn't God have any pepperonis either? Well, no, it isn't that. It's just that we don't ask God to do things that we can do ourselves. God gave us this wonderful world with lots of great things in it, like pepperonis, and it's up to us to take care of it. And when we want some, to make some pepperoni. Or, in your case, to go to the store and get some. I don't know. That doesn't sound very fair. Ah, uh, why not? Sounds like we're doing all the work. Ah, well, I think that all of this world and life itself is a pretty big gift from God. So it's up to us to do something right with the gift that we've been given. Oh, well, right now I need a gift of some pepperoni. Oh, I, I guess I better get going. All right, goodbye, Victor. Well, I hope he finds his pepperonis. Holy moly. Let's say a prayer. <laughs> Dear God, thank you for your creation and for all the things living. Help us to take care of everything in it, including all the people around us. Amen. <laughs> Join me in saying the prayer for illumination as we ask the Spirit to open our hearts and minds to God's Word. Jesus, we gather to hear you. Stir a yearning for you deep within us. Open the ears of our hearts to hear what the Spirit is saying so that your will might be accomplished through our lives. Amen. Our scripture reading is from the letter to first, first John in the fourth chapter. God is love, and those who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. We love because God loved us first. If anyone says, I love you, God, while holding hatred for another person, they do not have the truth in them. The person who doesn't love a person who he can see cannot love God who they cannot see.
each Sunday during this season of Lent. We've been looking at different prayers by a variety of folks, and today's prayer is probably one that you're more familiar with. In the 1940s, the YWCA published a version of it in their national magazine. In 1962, Hallmark began using the prayer in some of its greeting cards and also on wall plaques and posters and Christmas ornaments. The prayer was once quoted in the Calvin and Hobbes comic strip and musicians as diverse as Neil Young and Sinead O'Connor quoted this prayer. In the 1940s, Alcoholics Anonymous published the prayer, and for a while it was known as the AA prayer, and then later became known as the Serenity Prayer. But the origin of the prayer can be traced back to a pastor, writer, teacher, theologian by the name of Reinhold Niebuhr, who first presented it in a sermon in 1943 at Heath Evangelical Union Church in Heath, Massachusetts. The prayer as he originally wrote it is printed on the back of your bulletin and we will read it together. (coughs) God give us grace to accept with serenity the things that cannot be changed, courage to change the things that should be changed, and the wisdom to distinguish the one from the other. Now, in order to understand the intention behind this prayer, we have to know a little bit about Niebuhr and what was going on in the world at that time. Members of the Niebuhr family are something like rock stars for fans of 20th century Protestant theology. Niebuhr's father, Gustav, was a German immigrant, eventually moved to Lincoln, Illinois, where he was the pastor of the St. John United Church of Christ there. Gustav and his wife, Lydia, had four children, three of whom became famous theologians, writers, and teachers. Younger son, H. Richard Niebuhr taught for many years at Yale Divinity School. He authored a book called Christ and Culture, which Gene and I and thousands of would-be pastors and theologians read as a part of their schooling. Halda Niebuhr, the only daughter in the family, was discouraged by her father from pursuing an academic career, but after his death, she ignored his wishes got a college degree from the now defunct Lincoln College and then a graduate degree and taught at Boston University and at McCormick Presbyterian Seminary in Chicago. Reinhold became a pastor like his father and for a brief time after his father's death was pastor at the church in Lincoln. He went on to teach at Union Theological Seminary in New York City for over 30 years and for many of those years was considered one of our country's leading public intellectuals. He received the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1964. One of his most famous books, which we also read in seminary, was Moral Man and Immoral Society. But in the 1940s, before all the Niebuhrs became rock star theologians, Reinhold was the pastor of a small rural New England church. And all around him, he observed a society filled with anti-Irish, anti-Italian, anti-Polish, anti-Black, anti-Catholic, and anti-Semitic sentiments. Beginning in the 1930s, there had been a rise in repressive and authoritarian governments around the world and Western democracies could not necessarily be counted on to oppose national socialism or fascism. Niebuhr's daughter, who wrote a book about her father, said about that time in history, quick blooming xenophobia was and still is a famous American habit in times of stress. Hitler was gaining power in Germany 
World War II was getting underway, and America wasn't quite sure if they should get involved or not. For Niebuhr and many other American Christians, there was a question about the role of politics in faith. Should churches involve themselves in the actions of governments, or should they just stick with spiritual matters? The prayer that eventually became known for its ability to grant calm and serenity was originally intended to encourage action and courage in the face of great societal upheaval. The same year that he spoke this prayer in a sermon, Niebuhr wrote a book called The Children of Light and the Children of Darkness. Not a very subtle title. It was a, it was a critique of the struggle between democracy and totalitarianism. God give us grace, he prayed, to accept with serenity the things that cannot be changed. Niebuhr's critique of the liberals of his day was that they were too nice. They were too idealistic. In his mind, they were dreamers who sometimes imagined too easily that everything would just work out for the best. Niebuhr thought of himself as a more practical man. So he prayed, there are some things that cannot be changed. There are people and attitudes that are just not going to go away. Maybe it's been shocking for many of us to see the recent rise in racial and ethnic hatred. The FBI reports that the last decade has seen a steady rise in the number of hate crimes in our country. Niebuhr's prayer might counsel us to understand that there are things in our world that won't easily just disappear. Some attitudes and convictions cannot be changed, and we pray for the grace to accept this with a certain amount of serenity rather than anger or despair. But then Niebuhr urges us into action. He prays, Give us the courage to change the things that should be changed. The prayer does not assume that there's nothing we can do. There are actions we can take. There are decisions that need to be made. There are people who we can love. There are needs that need met. And notice how this part of the prayer doesn't ask God to do those things for us. Instead, it just asks for the courage to do them ourselves. When the Israelites were under the yoke of slavery in Egypt, Moses might have prayed to God to save them with some wave of the divine hand. But instead, God gave Moses the courage to face Pharaoh. Sometimes when we pray to God to help us, God gives us the courage to do it ourselves. And then the last thing Niebuhr prays for is the wisdom to distinguish the one from the other. Grace and courage are not enough. Courageously fighting against things that cannot change is foolish, but graciously accepting things we should change is equally foolish. Wisdom is that rare gift to discern the right action at the right moment. I'm pretty sure we've all had moments where we chose either the wrong action or the wrong moment. For Presbyterians, wisdom has always been thought of as a corporate gift. Socrates said, the only true wisdom is in knowing you know nothing. Foolish decisions are often the ones we make when we're certain we know what we're doing. But when we work together, when we listen to voices other than the ones that come from our own ego, then we can hear wisdom sometimes. That's why here at the church, we are anxious to form committees and task forces and boards. Wisdom is something that usually doesn't come to us alone. Important matters should be carefully and prayerfully considered. 
city by a group of people who together might discern the right action at the right moment. Niebuhr's prayer challenges us to consider the role of faith in political action. It's a tough question because in this time of division in our culture, we might come to worship on Sunday hoping for a respite from the angry rhetoric that we get the rest of the week. And I've heard many of you talk about challenging conversations you've had with friends and family who sit on the other side of the political divide from you. And you hesitate to continue those awkward and stressful encounters here at church. Written in the context of World War II and the social unrest here at home, Niebuhr's prayer charts a path that we might take as we balance God's claim on our lives and the political realities around us. The prayer clearly encourages us to advocate for change within the culture, but only after seeking wisdom for how and when such action might further God's call for compassion and love. After all, politics involves the way that we as a society decide to treat one another and how we might act together as a culture. And this is something about which Jesus has always had a lot to say. The Presbyterian Church came out of the 16th century Protestant Reformation in Europe and John Calvin, the father of Presbyterianism, had a strong belief in the importance of civic involvement. In his adopted city of Geneva, Switzerland, Calvin advocated for free public education, for full employment, regular garbage collection, for better medical and social services, among other things. Calvin believed it was important for Christians to live out their faith in the public square. Faith leads to action. In our earlier reading from 1 John, it suggests you can't say that you love God while at the same time holding hatred for another person. Our faith convictions have to bear witness in the way that we live out our lives. Archbishop Oscar Romero, who was assassinated in El Salvador for speaking out against oppression and injustice, once delivered a sermon in which he challenged every person to be a priest in whatever role they have in the world. He said, how beautiful it will be when all baptized persons understand that their work is priestly work. Just as I worship God in this church, he said, the carpenter worships God at his workbench, each metal worker, each doctor with a scalpel, the market woman at her stand is doing priestly work. If you are a cab driver, you are a priest at the wheel, consecrating that taxi of yours to God, bearing a message of peace and love to the passengers who ride in your cab. Maybe in our context, we might say, we are all ministers. If you're a teacher, your ministry is in your classroom. If you're a nurse, your ministry is in the hospital room. If you're a parent or grandparent or friend, your ministry is with those whom you love. If you're a citizen, an important part of your ministry is in this country, and you bear a message of peace and love, forgiveness and acceptance, in everything you do in the public sphere. To pray the serenity prayer is to accept the challenge of finding the way in which God is calling you to bear witness to Christ in the world. Not only in your home and among your closest friends, but in the wider culture, everywhere that God's restless spirit takes us. And I pray that each of you is able to do this with grace and courage and much wisdom this and every day.
Thanks be to God. Amen. seated. Again, in the end of this prayer, we will do another version of the Lord's Prayer, as we've been doing through Lent. And the version that we're saying today is by Manny Santiago in a resource from the Association of Welcoming and Affirming Baptists. So that the Lord's Prayer, is that printed in the bulletin? It's printed in the bulletin, and it will also be up here on the screen. Let us join together in prayer. God, give us grace to accept with serenity the things that cannot be changed. Courage to change the things that should be changed and the wisdom to distinguish the one from the other. Lord, we ask that you hear our prayer for indeed, we too now live in such a time in our history where the anti this and that seems much greater than what we can accomplish as if we are better together. If we think about all the things that we are anti, anti-immigrant, anti-poor, anti-homeless, anti any race or ethnicity that might be different from ours, anti LGBTQIA, anti government, anti Democrat, anti Republican, anti Jewish, anti Muslim, and a whole lot of suspicion thrown in there as well. Surely it is a time when grace and courage and wisdom are so desperately needed, Lord. So hear our prayer. Hear our prayers this day so that we might open our hearts and our ears, our eyes, to perceive a new way forward and to have the courage to love as you love, grace for forgiveness as you forgive, and wisdom to sow new seeds of life and hope and peace in the midst of division and incivility. Especially this morning, we continue in our prayers for those facing illness 
and life-limiting conditions. For those who know great loss from gun violence or other violence in their cities and communities. We lift up those who know hunger on a daily basis and those who have no place to call home. Give us the courage to find solutions to these situations and be willing to live them out. Lord, we lift up all the places where there is death and destruction due to war and violence. We lift up cities and states and countries where their governments are in chaos and confusion. And most of all, Lord, we pray for the ceasing of hatred and enmity between all your children, between peoples around the world. It is indeed a list that repeats itself over and over again. So give us serenity to, surrect, to accept the things that cannot be changed, courage to change the things that should be changed, and the wisdom to distinguish one from the other. We pray this in all our prayers in the name of the one who showed us how to live with grace, courage, and wisdom, Jesus, and who also taught all his followers to pray together, saying, Our parent who is among us, blessed be your creation. May your reign be a reality here on earth. May we become more interested in building your kingdom here and now than in waiting for it to come down from above. Let us share our bread with those who hunger. Let us learn to forgive as well as to receive forgiveness. Help us through the time of temptation, delivering us all from evil. For ours are the eternal blessings that you pour upon the earth. Amen. Indeed, my friends, we have many blessings. So now let us stand and sing together as we thank God for the blessings in our lives so that they may be used to help your work further in this world. Let us pray. Gracious God, bless these gifts that we offer today so that you might use them to do your work in this place. And bless each one of us here, the gifts inside each one of us, that we might use them to serve you and our neighbors around us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
May God grant each of us grace and courage and wisdom so that we might be filled with hope in all the things God calls us to do. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be among us now and with us always. Amen. Amen.